Approaching Hook Norton on the Bambi Road, at the site which was called the Kissing Trees, we leave Wigginton Parish and enter Hook Norton Parish. Hook Norton Parish is said to be around 5,340 acres. A short distance on, if we look to our right, we see Council Hill. On our left is Butter Hill which is divided into several small fields. Each of these fields has the name Butter included in it. The entrance to the manor or Lampitz farm. This farm together with Mill Farm were church property till the 19th century. The Lampets appear to have been the most important people in Hook Norton in the 18th century. We pass the Brimbo Cottages. And on our right, the Brimbo Ironstone Works. Mr. Turnock Senior standing in the entrance. All that remains of the steam engine house building. This engine drove a lift which took the filled tubs of ironstone to a gantry at the top of the kilns, where the tubs were then tipped into the kilns. Originally, there were only two drying kilns. Stone was mostly brought to the kilns from the Brimbo side of the Bambury Road, but it was also brought from the park area on a line passing the bottom side of Brimbo Cottages through a tunnel under the road and up to the Ironstone Works. Two more kilns were added around 1913, one on either side. They generated their own electricity in those days and it was a wonderful sight to see it all lit up on a winter's evening. Here we see some of the men who worked there standing in front of the Riddler. This road was originally known as Moore's Lane. It was said there was a gate across it, just outside the village. It continued on as a track through open fields. Two centuries ago, the road to Banbury could have been via Sidford Road, turning right at Gate Hangs High. Around 1925, this road from the pear tree at Scotland End to the Aethrix 361 past Milcombe was used for an experimental road covering. A heavy machine putting down the surfacing material followed by steam rolling. As a small boy, boy I remember roller skating from the village centre to the Wigginton Cross Roads and back on this new super surface. This lane on the hooky side of the Brimbo site was in use quite a lot in the past. To come out the top side of Neil Farm or to bear right-handed for Lodge Farm. Carters would use this route with their teams and wagons as a shortcut to the railway goods yard. This field on the moor side was called Horsepool Field. At the beginning of this century, it was a good meadow. W. Baker and Sons, who used horse and cart to draw stone from their workings to the station, turned their horses out here to graze at the end of the day's work.
the railway hotel. The entrance to the station. On the 6th of April 1887, the railway opened to regular passenger service with four trains each way from Banbury to Kingham. In the early part of this century, wagons and their teams could be seen lined up from Hollybush Corner to the goods yard, bringing sacks of corn, trust hay, etc., to unload into railway wagons and taking away coal, lime and feedstuffs. The road bridge by the station, about to be demolished, and Mr Turnip's taxi, the last motor vehicle under it. Approaching the station, demolished in the 60s. July 1887 was the first seaside excursion to Portsmouth. 500 tickets were allotted, more could have been sold. The good shed and the verducts beyond. The Cardiff to Newcastle Express passing through the station. Looking down on the recent excavation of Mr. Gasson's Lake. Before the Brimbo came into production, round the, end, round the end of the last century, stone was dug on the other side of the lake and transported to the station. This site has recently been levelled out. Stone was taken up this track called Engine House Lane by cable and tub. It passed through this tunnel under the road into what is now Austin's Way and then to the near first bird pillar to be unloaded. The three pillars of the first bird. We are now by the first pillar. A wall was built up here and this is where the tubs that came from the other side of the lake were tipped into railway trucks. A railway engine then took the field trucks round the back of the station and up to the main line. Here we see the route of the line on the way to the station.
and the final incline up to the station. From Wigginton Heath on the old Banbury Road, we cross the parish boundary just before we get to Hook Norton Lodge Farm. In August 1883, Lodge Farm Cricket Club was found, formed. In their first match, they beat King Sutton by 24 runs. To the side of Lodge Farm, we just see the site of the old pub called the Fox and Hounds. A very interesting old building, regrettably finally demolished about 1960. It was said to be a favourite call for the Welsh drovers on their way to Banbury Market. Before being demolished, before being demolished, it had been converted to two cottages. Across the road to our left, the field called White Hills Fuzz. In the 1920s, this field was practically covered with gorse. The occupant of Lodge Farm often let it to the gypsies, who came here in large numbers. Besides making pegs to sell, they also made walking sticks from the gorse. This walking stick came from the gypsies in this field. We are now just above Neil Farm, looking into the field called the Rookery. There were a large quantity of elm trees here, hence the Rookery. Rook shooting took place on May the 12th, followed by the Rook Pies. To the left of the rookery were the warrens. Rabbit berries covered a large area of these fields in the past. Through the rookery and this gate came the wagons from the lane by the Brimbo, shown earlier. They could then cross the Bambury Road and make their way by Bacon Farm and Swakelyff Common. The second field on the right towards Bacon Farm is Priest's Field or Priest Top. This is the earliest known field name, 1155. Mill Farm House. First mentioned in 1706. The fine old dovecot in the yards at Nil. Dovecots were usually a privilege of Lords of the Manor or religious houses. On the opposite side of this yard, the cart horse stables. In the early part of this century, 16 horses were housed here, and the head carter and his men could be seen bringing out eight pair, pairs ready of ploughing. To the right of the stables, the barn, where the seed corn was winnowed and dressed. No man dare step in here unless his boots were perfectly clean. Looking down towards Lower Nell and Swakelyff Common, 
In the 1930s, there was a small farmhouse here with buildings. But over the years, an additional dwelling has been built with a large complex of farm buildings. The gate hangs high and the cross roads. In the 18th century, hook his main road to Banbury. And at this time, there was a gateway across the Sidford Road. Numerous gypsies passed this way to the Stowe Fairs and a long string of ponies could be seen, each one having its halter tied to the tail of the one in front. Down the Sidford Ferris Road and on our right hand side we look along the old road to Lower Nell and Swakelet Common. Just below this road and adjoining the Sidford Ferris Road was a pound, a half acre plot hedge fence. In the 1960s Hook Norton Parish Council sold the pound land to the adjoining owner and the boundary fence was removed. We are now on the other crossroads at Coleman's Elm. This name existed in 1683. The barn, a recent house conversion. We have taken the Temple Mill Road, passing Six Ash and Podge Farm on our left. And we are now looking at a field of rape on the Sidford side of the Stour. Looking from the south towards Temple Mill, those with corn to grind and sheep for washing would have come here. The Stour Valley and Parish Boundary between Temple Mill and Traitor's Ford. And Hook Norton Lay Farm on the left hand side. Traitor's Ford. Hook Norton Parish ends here and takes the route of the old road towards Great Rollroad. There were three co-pasture farms between the Oatley Hill Road and the Ford to Rollroad Road. This was the lower one. Fifty years ago it was known as Starball. This is the middle one, once known as Otley Farm. And the upper cow pasture. The old bridle road from the bottom of Oakley Hill came past middle cow, cow pasture shown here and across this field onto the old Rollright Road. Seen here. Through this gate, just a little way opposite, and then down to the west side of Ascot Hamlet. The old saying that some sect in the village met for secret worship in a deep hollow between Cowpasture Farm and Ascot Village would 
obviously be this hollow adjoining the old bridle road. Witchford Hill Crossroads, 785 feet above sea level and the highest point on the Hook Norton Parish boundary. Also nearly one of the highest points in Oxfordshire. Towards Great Rollwright, the parish boundary turns left-handed down this old bridle road. down which we pass Court Farm on our left. And on our, on our right hand side, this interesting stretch of stone walling. All the stones used being exceptionally thin. this road the parish boundary carries on for about straight on for about half a mile and then turns right handed and in almost a straight line to the river Swer. and where the parish boundary crosses the road on its way to the Swer. The Hook Norton entrance to Swerford Park. The site of Hook Norton Mill and the end of the mill race. The mill race stretched back some two fields to join the swer swerve. Corn was ground here to the beginning of this century and later the mill was demolished and the stone used to build the house up above. Leaving Swerford on the Wigginton Road we see the Swer on our right hand side. And a short distance upstream is where the parish boundary leaves the river and takes a straight line to the kissing trees where we started this film. The park, the site for many celebrations in the past. New houses being erected on part of the park. In the 16th century, it was said there was a coppice of 40 acres in the park. the pillars that carried the girder work towards the tunnel. Both of these single track verducts ran 90 feet above the valley and took 400 men four years to construct. The size of the stone, the jointing and erection must amaze any of us today. Where did this stone come from? Was it from a nearby quarry? The fairies at the carnival in the park, celebrating the coronation of King George V.
the pillar complete. Underneath the girders was a catwalk used by the permanent way ganger to make a daily inspection of the ironwork. A trapdoor on the, to the track either side of the pillar allowed him to complete his journey. From the Swerford Road we look down to the site of the Earl of Dudley works. These commenced in 1901 and closed down in 1916, dismantled around 1920. Various workings in the valley supplied the kiln by the viaduct. The calcined ore was brought up the valley in tubs by a cable system to a gantry and the tubs tipped into railway trucks positioned on a branch line. The position of the gantry and the engine house that drove the cable. This is the point where the branch line left the main line. The branch line passing by the gantry and carrying on for some distance in the direction of Wigginton. Coal was also fed from trucks on this branch line to a cable system, which took the coal to the kiln and engine house below. The viaduct the park and the new development. Looking over the top of the pillars towards the stations. In December 1885, the scaffolding round one of the pillars collapsed, killing two men. The road bridge over the Swerford Road. The 76 feet deep South Hill cutting. In the autumn 1876, around 2,000 men, 120 horses and seven engines were working on this embankment, the tunnel and viaduct. the embankment. The entrance to the tunnel, approximately half a mile long. Two men were killed in the cutting up to the tunnel in 1876, one by a fall of clay. In 1890, a man sent to warn train drivers of a landslide here was run over and killed. Stephen is standing where the tunnel crosses under the top Swerford Road and the signpost right turn to Southrop. There was a substantial I oak rail fence on both sides of the road here, some 20 yards wide. This no doubt was to define ownership by the railway. The only sign 
left of the fence. On the Hook Norton side of the Swerford Road, this large mound was the spoil left lifted out through a shaft from the tunnel. And then on the other side of the road was another shaft where the spoil was lifted out. the embankment on the raw right side of the tunnel. The entrance to the tunnel from the great raw right end. from the tunnel looking down towards Great Rollright. During the construction of the tunnel close by, these roadside verges were taken up by workmen's huts and living quarters. They even grew vegetables on the roadside verges. With the spoil removed, men with pickaxe and shovel fill the trams. Now we see the 042 saddle tank engine ready to take the filled tubs from the quarry face. Brought into use around 1914 was the Ruston Steam Navvy. This large machine excavated the quarry face, stone and overburden together, riddled the latter out and loaded the stone into trams ready to be taken to the kilns. From South Hill we look down on the brewery. The church. and the park. The population in 1200 was 360. In 1833, when the asylum and workhouse were occupied, 1,500. In 1881, 1,232. Inhabited houses, 308. Uninhabited, 34. In 1911, 1,350 and today 1,600 and rising sharply. Here we are on top of Oatley Hill, looking down on the brewery and the church. In the foreground is the marshes.
and on, a, on our way to the village we passed Sugarswell Farm, a name that has been in existence since 1260. Turning right at Coleman Down, we come to the road leading to Scotland End, which in the 18th century was called Mill Way. Immediately right-handed is the old top entrance road to the marshes. Villagers went up this lane to their small holdings and one acre plots. Continuing in, in the direction of Scotland End, we come to Hay Way. This was the main route to the marshes. Much produce was brought down here by the villagers to their homesteads. Wagons of hay for winter fodder and milk carried on yokes. Also up this lane was Fanthill Farm from where a man named Baylis delivered milk with a pony and float up to about the end of the First War. Dwelling on Clay Bank. At Scotland End, the Pear Tree Inn, a Hook Norton brewery house since 1869. And to our right, Round Close, which at the turn of the century was well stocked with trees. Looking towards Chipping Norton, Prior to 1820, when the bridge was built, there was a ford here. To our left, probably a swamp. To the right was Washbrook Ditch, a place banked up to collect water. From the bridge, we see Brooklyn Farm House. Harwood Farm House. To our left, now modernised and extended, what was Wheelwright's Cottage? Scotland End Bridge, prior to the development on the left hand side. The same bridge, probably at an earlier date, as seen from the opposite direction, with the Wheelwright's Cottage workshop occupied by several generations of the Hall family who were also carpenters and well sinkers. Another view from the bridge, date 1904. Mr Hall with his portable steam engine and thrashing drum. Coming into Bourne Lane from Clay Bank, Horace Townley with his horse and cart. He delivered coal and he also collected the village refuse. Looking up Brewery Lane, had we stood here at the beginning of this century when the brewery was very busy, we, we may well have seen one of their four-wheel delivery vans appear. These were double shafts with a pair of horses, or maybe a loaded dray or cart. A Foden steam wagon was also being used at this time for some of the longer journeys. On the right hand side of the lane 
This house was said to be the White Lion pub years ago. On our left, the entrance to Pool Yard. This is where the local inhabitants collected their water from a spring. Farther up the lane, Juniper Cottage. On the right hand side of Juniper Cottage, this wall said to be the remains of two thatched cottages, which stood endways to the road. They were burnt down in the 1850s and at the same time set fire to two cottages on the opposite side of the road. The brewery was started and being built up in the 1850s by the Harris family and was becoming very prosperous by the 1860s. During the 1890s, a new brewery, new stables and new offices were built. But brewery was kept for full production during the new building. At the beginning of this century, 24 men were employed on the production line. This included the malt house, barrel washing and racking. Behind the brewery, we see the old stables with loft up above or hay and chaff. On the delivery side was the head stableman and 15 draymen, making a total of 40 men employed by the brewery. Hours work 6 a.m. till 6 p.m. with one and three quarter hours out for breaks. Wages at this time seemed stationary. A man's pay around 15 shillings to one pound per week. The most extraordinary thing at this time was the draymen getting a halfpenny for every empty bottle they brought back to the brewery. This considerably boosted their wages. These buildings at the back are the remains of the first brewery. The Thornley steam engine has performed the brewery motive power since 1900. Originally fired by coal, but now oil fired. Considered by many as the most interesting part of the brewery. Cast iron girders came from Samuelson's Iron Foundry in Bambury. Oh. The timber from the village merchant James Harris in there. The vats and other equipment from Buxton and Corley, Burton on Trent. All the stone was said to come from local quarries. This is the first stage of the new brewery. Behind is the old brewery to be demolished to make way for the new power section. Okay. The beginning of the work on the new tower section. Note the number of men. Barrels being loaded onto the old steam wagon.
that was the a pleasant view of the church across the valley of the Rop stream. As early as 1316, this side has been a separate hamlet of Southrop. This name appeared in legal documents to distinguish it from Hook Norton till the 19th century. On the edge of Swerford, of Southrop, and from the Swerford, ro Swerford Road, we look towards Croft Bank. The overspill from various celebrations in the village came here, and occasionally other functions. This house was a public house in the past, the Fleur de Lis, till the middle of the last century, when it was changed to the wheat sheaf. This closed about 1950. Two other public houses mentioned, but long since gone, were the Plough and the Crown. On this corner was the Southrop Pound, a plot of land for detaining stray animals. By 1856, they were no longer in use. At this time, the parish constables were replaced by the county police. It is interesting to note that Southrop had its own parish constable. Here we see the tight on Cross Bank. A short way into Brick Hill, and on the right-hand side, we see what was Tom Smith's butcher's shop. This house in the 1920s went with Fanfield Farm up Hay Way. On the left-hand side, we've entered Southrop Farmyard turned into private occupation about 1960. The original farmhouse bearing a date of 1645, now almost unreadable. On the front of the house, the unusual moulded stonework, the centre obviously of a later date. There is a similar one on the end of the house. An old cottage probably the stables with stone steps to the granary and the old dairy converted to one dwelling. Towards Southrop House we look across to the site of the Friends Meeting House which was first mentioned in deeds dated 1705 and demolished in recent years. Southrop House The date, 1707 RPS, probably stands for Richard and Sarah Parks, but house considered earlier than this. An unusual round window at the top of the staircase to the attics. and at the back of the house, an outside staircase.
along Berrycroft Road on the left hand side the parish allotments with one corner still in use. On the Chippy Norton Road looking towards Scotland End and Mr. Golby's barn an old road bared off here for Court Farm and the Boundary Road. Looking towards the bottom of South Hill, one time a ford. On the right hand side, the footpath to the allotments on the Big Heath, 26 acres. The entrance to Fanville Farm, also an entrance for horse-drawn vehicles to the Big Heath allotments and an old road to Berryfields Farm. From the top of South Hill, the entrance to the small Heath allotment. which is a field of six acres. The big heath allotment is a second field along from here. These two fields set apart by the award of 1774 when the open fields of Hook Norton and Southrop were enclosed belong to the parish council and are called the Heath Allotment Charity. Now let to local farmers, the rent money is allotted annually to the poor of the village. Returning to the east side of Southrop, we look up Ashburton Lane. On our left, by the entrance to the park, lived George Summerton, carrier in the last century. Still in Park Road, the Catholic Church built in the 1930s. Rope Way, the land on the left prior to development, private allotments. Towards downtown, the home of Charles Whiten and Sons Carriers. In the 1920s, they went to the Plough in Banbury, Mondays, Thursdays and Saturdays. In latter years, a motor vehicle was used. In 1875, Hook Norton had three carriers, going three and four times a week to Banbury, Chipping Norton on other days. Downtown from the bottom of Park Lane. The bakery today. Mr. Christmas, a baker, moved from West Wisteria House to here around 1914 and delivered bread in two nicely turned out horse-drawn vans. Bell Hill. In 1770, inoculation against smallpox had become common practice. But in the 19th century, fear of smallpox, smallpox was so great, the overseers blocked the road up this hill with thorns to prevent people passing a house with a case. Player shop, wallpaper and decorating materials. In the 1920s, Frederick Bayliss kept a, kept a baker and grocery shop here. Middle Hill, probably the most used route in the past from the south coming out into High Street, the square, and to the church. 
passing two forges on the way. There was a tight here. It had a fence around and steps down to running water, which never failed. Locals drank it for a thousand years. Extra sources of water were the 137 wells. To our left is Bridge Hill. The Rock Stream. Looking up Berrycroft Road and the outside staircase. Now, almost full circle, we see Bridge House, the home of the Dickens family. Miss Margaret wrote the history of Hook Norton 1912 to 1928. Honorary organist at the church for many years and together with her sister Barbara gave much to the welfare of the village. Around 1725 to 1854 this house was a private lunatic asylum. There was a padded cell and separate gardens for male and female inmates. and the stone bridge, the oldest in the village, widened in the 19th century to the left. There were tan pits by the stream here. Downtown, probably at the beginning of this century. Note the thatched property the old oil lamp post on the left hand side and the fence tight just behind it. Hook Norton Choir in 1912 standing on the Chipping Norton Town Hall steps after a contest. Margaret Dickens is in the centre. We've now come to Down End to have a look round here. There was another tight behind this council van. A high and low spouted hand pump and trough. A cap on the bottom spout allowed easier filling of the water cart from the top spout. The mains water did not come to Hook Norton until 1955 and the sewerage scheme 1965. Just inside these railings was well close. A chapel was built here around 1829 and pulled down in 1875 when the new chapel was built. The cemetery was opened here in 1899 and the churchyard and the churchyard closed. Looking up down end, we see Stuart House. built with stone from thatched cottages just above it that were burnt down on St Peter's Day 1914. James Harris, who was running a busy and thriving timber yard adjoining, moved into this house when completed. A double door entrance to the timber yard was here and a double door exit here.
trees were sawn down in this yard to supply the local wheelwright. The Rop stream crossed the road here before being bridged over. One of the Harris traction engines passing Banbury Cross with two loaded timber wagons. Here we see following behind the second traction engine with three loaded wagons both on their way to the timber yard at Down End. Black Prince in the timber yard with Mr. Harris standing in front. Leading up Down End we come to what was another tight. To our left, what was the asylum yard with large wooden doors to the entrance. A fine old house on the left formed part of the asylum and was used for the staff, the paying patients and kitchen. A long red brick building three stories high on the top side has the poorer patients and those in a dangerous condition. Over 100 patients lived here. These premises were closed in 1854 when the county asylum was built. After closure, the building on the top side was converted into six cottages. The whole was demolished around 1960 and a new development took place. Looking up Bell's Lane, the home of Nelson Chapman, beer retailer. This house at the top of Down End was once a wheelwright shop and then Turnock's bus depot. Around 1930, a trailer pump was kept here for the fire brigade and one of the Turnock buses was used to tow it. This shop was once Coleman's, who killed and cured their own pork, followed by Pillsworth, who sold grocery, china, drapery and furniture. Entering High Street, on this corner was the co-op, who baked their own bread and delivered this and grocery over a wide area in the 1890s. The bell, where many social functions took place. Bell's Chur, where there were once two cottages. This end of central stores was Turnock Shop. Ironmonger, cycle, oil and general household goods. And the site of the first petrol pump. They also ran the first bus and taxi service. This was once a house between two shops, the weaver's window at the top. The butcher's shop run by F. Busby, Busby in the early part of this century and before then a grocer's shop. The sundial on the adjoining house. The bank which was the post office in the 1920s. This shop was a tailor, hatter and draper. Reeves House, 
said to be occupied by Robert Reeves in 1775. Frank Phipps ran a butcher's shop here for some 40 years. The Sun Inn and the Lion. The bus shelter. At the beginning of this century, the old oil lamp, oil street lamps were housed here. In the 18th century, it was said to be the lockup. Hook Norton called it the dungeon. The Borsbury blacksmith's shop. The horse-drawn Merriweather manual fire pump was kept down Bridge Hill in what was called the engine house. The brigade was summoned by the Ting Tang in the church tower. A pair of horses had to be found from the carriers or anywhere else they were available before they could move off with the engine. In the late 1920s, the church bells were still being used to summon the brigade. An interesting doorway up Middle Hill. Manning Shop, in the early part of this century, heritage the Sadler. Henry Borsbury, who lived where the Stubbinsons are now, was a shoemaker and carrier. Down Bell Hill was a draper, milliner, and boot repairer. A scene in High Street 100 years ago. This was the first bus in Hook Norton, a Ford Model T, 1921, 14-seater. The Turnip family lined up in front of it. Turnip shop, early 1920s. Note the delivery van. Wisteria House, with Busby above the shop door on the right. The butchers, F. Busby, ham and bacon curer, taken before 1914. The band parading in High Street for the 1925 flower show. Middle Hill, no sweet shop and thatched roof. Next to the church was Hyatt the Draper. Club Day 1902, stalls on the right by the churchyard wall. And swings in the square by the Sun Inn. 
St. Peter's Church, erected in the 14th century, restored 1845 at a cost of nearly £3,000. In 1913, a new clock was installed, having three doors instead of one, placed rather higher than the first one. The churchyard wall was set back and lowered in 1960. On the headstone of Nathaniel Appletree, 1786, is this verse. He was, but room won't let me tell you what, name what a friend should be, and he was that. He was in dispute with a bishop in 1773 over ties. Opposite the churchyard, the first post office in living memory also a news agent, was kept by Fanny Harris. In November 1880, a second delivery of mail started after a petition. The Old School. Built in 1885, on the site of five cottages, a barn and small buildings. The cost of the site and £500 towards the building was given by Miss Davis of Swerford Park. Prior to 1896, there were five bells in the tower. But during the next four years, the bells were rehung on a steel frame and three more added. The niche over this west window was probably occupied by a statue of St. Peter, but removed by the reformers in the 17th century. An old barrel played Purcell's tune, Britain Strike Home, on the bells in the 18th century. Prior to the Great War, the tenor bell was rung every day at noon, and at 8 p.m. this had probably been the custom for 800 years. The noon bell, probably the pre-Reformation Angelus bell. In 1867, the first heating apparatus was installed and Dolby Phipps, who was clerk for 54 years, was put in charge. Dolby Phipps standing in the church porch. The position of the clock face before it was raised when the other two were installed. The flower show in the shearing close. Now children's playing field. Note the hats. At the back of the old school, we see the infant school. Built around 1900, this allowed for the education of over 300 children. Samuel Timms, a baker, lived here and later moved his business to the house opposite the village hall. Looking down Nettin Street, from the churchyard to Scotland End, all the north side were small homesteads in the 18th century. This house opposite the chapel entrance was until a few years ago a thatched barn, stables and dwelling. George Archer lived here and ran an early taxi service with a Ford Model T. 
the entrance to the Baptist chapel. Until the last war, there were iron railings on the roadside and gates at the entrance which were kept locked. A Baptist congregation was formed around 1640. This chapel, built in 1871, stands on the site of a previous one. In 1728, Hook Norton was a centre for 22 other villages, Stowe in the Wold and Ilmington, 13 miles, the most distant. The Baptist Church Schoolroom. The foundation stone laid May the 8th, 1873, and the cost said to be around 300 pounds to build it. The schoolroom stands on the site of three cottages. The position of the well that supplied them can still be seen here. And the oak tree planted to comm commemorate Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, 1897. This house, once the manse, was built in 1781 at the same time as the chapel. Just above the manse was the entrance to the bakehouse allotments, a plot of land behind the chapel purchased by the trustees in 1803. In the garden at the back of the manse, was an open-air baptistry, later moved to the chapel. The house next to the manse. Ted Clifford, the stonemason, lived here in the early part of this century. He also travelled the area with a cider press and pulpit. To the right-hand side was his stables and buildings. Many alterations have taken place here in recent years, including this overhead addition. When Ted Clifford retired, Horace Townley moved to here with his coal business. Looking up Watery Lane, this house on the right was occupied by John Thomas Bench, who was a Thatcher, and probably his father, John Thomas Bench Sr., who was a carrier in the last century to Bambury and Chippy Norton. The land above, now developed, was an orchard that went with this property. This property on the left side of Watery Lane was where Haynes, the baker, lived till the mid-twenties. He also delivered bread in a horse-drawn vehicle. This made a total of five bakers making bread, delivering bread at the beginning of this century. This was Francis Beale's sweet shop. This Thatch property, now one dwelling, was three cottages. Robert Gardner, Thatcher, lived here. His brother, 
Elijah was also a thatcher. The entrance to the footpath from Netton Street to Berrycroft Lane. Prior to 1850, the owner of the house, which is now called the manor, paid a fine of fourpence per year to the lord of the manor for the encroachment of these steps onto the road. This was the home of George Mobley, carrier in 1928, who went to Banbury Town Hall. He had an unusual converted, converted brake type motor vehicle. His wife drove and he usually stood on the back step. Looking towards the church from Netting Street. Netting Street at the beginning of this century. The present school in the Bourne for children up to the age of 11 years. The entrance to the old council house estate. There was a tall Scotch fir tree here at the beginning of this century. It is said that there was a tithe barn here several centuries ago. The old council houses, built from stone, dug on the site, completed in 1922 and cost 1,100 each. The shearing close, now the children's playground. and developed on this side with bungalows. The fire station in Bourne Lane. Below the fire station was Blackbird Orchard the club day fairground equipment moved from the streets to here in more recent years. An entrance to Shearing Close was here. This was where villagers in the past made their way to the annual flower show. At the top of Queen Street and on the right hand side was a steel frame building that housed a generator, a private concern set up in the early 1920s which supplied electricity to about 68 of the larger houses and also some street lights. Electricity was only available whilst the generator was running. An outside staircase behind the house at the top of Queen Street. Looking down Queen Street, at one time called Garrett's Lane. Early this century there were six cottages on our right hand side. The top one set back a little with a well in front of it. Then four up to the pavement and one behind. Dick White lived at the bottom and was a boot repairer. At the top was Wilfred Weston and his blacksmith shop. The present Baptist Manse 
and the entrance to Osmeet Close. Osney Close was Berry Orchard, Berry Orchard allotments and with the manse belonged to the Baptist Chapel. This corner of Berry Orchard was retained by the Baptists for a burial ground. Oxford Down Sheep in the Shearing Close at the beginning of this century. Down Mobs Lane we passed Dr. Lehman's surgery, recently updated. We then come to the present post office. Owners in previous years have traded in green grocery, second hand furniture and not long ago a chemist. Opposite the post office is the entry to what was the Buckbird Public House, closed around 1914. It was a Hopcroft and Norris house. The earliest authority for a Wesleyan congregation in Hook Norton was around 1794. Built of the stone from the old chapel together with the materials of five cottages that stood on the site. The laying of the foundation stones was May 1875. This house, which until recently was the post office, has a date stone 1676, initials PTM. The first telephone exchange was operated from here. Samuel Timms ran a bakery business here after his move from the dwelling next to the old school house. The shop window was the one on the right. The memorial hall standing on part of what used to be the village pound. It was opened on the 14th of October 1922 and the cost, including the furniture, was around £2,500. It was built by Alfred Williams. Sidford Road, previously the horse fair, where in the early 1800s, horses and cattle were shown and sold. Before this, it was known as Hayden's Lane. To our left, the butts. There were several cottages up here in the past. Dr. Routh of Sidford, who practiced in the village, had Swiss Cottage built. The Glebe, completed in 1947 on what was church allotments. The Green. The end of the Green was William Cole's bakehouse, which was burnt down in the turn of the century. Other tradesmen in the green, on the Green included carriage builder, stonemason, seedsman, newsagent, fruitier, and the station master. Hope Norton depended mainly on Sidford for its doctors. Dr. Routh and Dr. Mottram held surgery in part of this house. Later, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Agnew used a temporary building on the left-hand side of the Sidford Road. On this corner at the top of Tight Lane, Mr. Lightfoot, an excise officer for the brewery, 
built a strict Baptist chapel in use for about 30 years, demolished around 1940. Lincoln's Inn and Salford's could have been connected with the manorial holding of the 16th century. This present garage at Lincoln's Inn was used for weaving. The weaving industry continued till the 19th century. Richard Bister, the last in Hook Norton, used this doorway at the garage for collection and delivery of cloth and yarn. James Harris lived here before he moved to Down End. He conducted his timber business at the rear of the house. The horses for the timber carriages were housed in the stables here. His son John lived here after he left. There were two long case clockmakers in Hook Norton. William Webb was one, and John Payne, who was known to be in the village in 1840, and probably lived here at Ivy Dean. East End Farm House. Occupied in 1799 by Lionel Lampett and bought that year by William Minchin for 500 guineas. It was he who probably added this castellation. In its fine old buildings, there is now a flourishing pottery business. The green after the fire of William Cole's bakery. Here we see the home of Alfred Williams, carpenter, coal merchant, builder and undertaker. A large area of land behind the dwelling, now developed, was where, with a stationary engine, he sawed his timber. On display were special type three-wheel poultry houses that he made. He employed about 40 men and boys. Down this lane was the workhouse. In 1774, it was bought by the church wardens and overseers and rethatched. Around 1814, there were 24 inmates. It was sold in 1836 when the Banbury workhouse was opened and converted into nine cottages. The rents were 40 and 30 shillings a year. An oven house was built for the use of the cottages. Towards Hollybush Corner, this house in the 1930s had the thatch removed, the roof in timber replaced, was retiled, a new chimney, guttering, etc. Total cost under £100. On the opposite side of the road, the cottage and buildings were all thatched. Heritage the saddler moved from High Street and carried on his business in a building here. Where these two bungalows now stand were six thatched cottages, two rows endways onto the road, a well situated between them for water supply. They were demolished in the 1950s and the stone used to build the bungalows. This is Hollybush Corner. The large red bedded tree was cut down when the bungalows were built. It was from this corner that the parade started for the various celebrations in the village. We have come to the end of our journey through the parish, but we will conclude 
with a few more pictures of the past. The corner at East End in the 1930s. Alfred Williams House, then thatched. Note the old lamp post in the centre. Hook Norton Band about 1930. All the names of the group can be given apart from the young lad in the open neck shirt. They led the parades through the village in the last century. The Britannia Works banned from Banbury seemed to fill the role then. Here we see the line that came from the park by Brimbo Cottages, under the road and up to the works. Down End and the Wilderness Allotment, now developed with bungalows. Looking towards the triangle at the bottom of Sidford Road. The thatch on the house at the back was replaced by tiles in the 1930s. The bottom of High Street in the 1940s. Gaddis took over from Turnocks in 1937. The two petrol pumps with the delivery pipes hanging down by the two ladies with the pram. The Gaddis taxi on the right side of the road. We are now looking at what is the present central stores. In the 1960s the two dwellings on the left hand side were bought and the whole turned into one dwelling. The one with the bay window had been a grocer's shop. Here we are looking down the station at the station from the goods yard side. A train from Banbury direction has just pulled into the station. Here we see the goods shed on our left, the station on the right and the existing railway hotel in the centre. This concludes our film.